Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. My name is Jim Shope. I'm a senior fellow here in the Asia program. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to our program today on Japan's revised National Defense Program Guidelines, or NDPG. You're going to hear NDPG and probably a whole lot of other acronyms a lot today. Um, before we begin our program, I want to take a moment to thank our co-host, co-organizer, uh, really the organization responsible for bringing this program uh, together, the Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA, or SPF USA, if you use another acronym. Uh, Jim Zumwalt uh, and his team uh, there, Sayuri Rome, who's my counterpart in, in putting this program together, and she did a lot of the work um, uh, to make today possible, and there will be a publication uh, that comes out of not only this event today, but the work that, that our panelists and, and participants uh, will be providing. Um, Japan first prepared a national defense program outline, they called it then, uh, in 1977, 1978. Uh, it didn't revise it for almost 20 years after that, um, but the end of the Cold War created quite a change uh, for Japan. And then with constant change in the post-Cold War environment, uh, revision of the guidelines became a much more common occurrence, maybe every 10 years and then more recently, almost every five years uh, or thereabouts. And it's, it's coincided this time with Japan's production or uh, 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 drafting of a midterm defense uh, plan, uh, which is really its procurement plan for five years. And so the, the coming together of this defense strategy with its budget and, and procurement plan is really uh, an important moment for Japan's defense policy and I think also obviously for the U.S.-Japan uh, alliance. Um, now, the title of this program, we, we added the, the, the concept of a third uh, post-Cold War era um, with the idea, in my mind at least, that in the immediate post-Cold War era was this moment of American uh, primacy. Uh, you really had uh, a, a very different security environment with interventions in Kosovo and other parts uh, around the world, this idea of kind of peacekeeping and multilateral coalitions to, to help uh, uh, maintain uh, stability and prosperity around the world. Changed drastically in the 9-11 uh, attacks in, the, uh, in 2001 and, and kind of the uh, era of the, the, the war on terror or uh, 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 extensive conflict in the Middle East and Afghanistan, uh, which I guess I would consider kind of a second post-Cold War era. And it's quite possible that we're, we're entering a third uh, era now, uh, characterized by a return to long-term strategic competition and rivalry uh, in Asia in particular, and with a military dimension. Uh, so I think uh, Japan's assessment or reassessment of its uh, defense policy at this time is, is particularly important. So we'll divide up the, the morning into two parts today. Uh, we're going to start uh, by looking at some of the uh, operational aspects of uh, Japan's new, new policies. Um, and then uh, the second panel will look at the policy implications and in particular uh, with an alliance uh, focus uh, at that point. Uh, at this moment, I'd like to turn the microphone over to uh, the CEO of uh, SPF USA, Jim Zumwalt, uh, who's a, a great friend and a, a great partner to, to work with. Uh, as you all know him for his long career in the State Department. Ambassador Zumwalt, uh, I'll give you the... Thank you and welcome everyone. We're, very, we're delighted to see you all here and it's great to see how much interest there is in uh, Japan's uh, security policy and U.S.-Japan uh, alliance issues. Uh, just very briefly, uh, Sasakawa USA is an uh, organization dedicated to promoting a strong U.S.-Japan relationship through uh, improving mutual understanding by programs such as this. So we're delighted to partner with Carnegie uh, and our goal today hopefully is to um, help educate an American audience about the Japan's new guidelines and also what they mean for the alliance and what are the um, opportunities that we have to further strengthen our relationship. So without further ado, I'll turn things back over to Jim so we can get started on today's panel. Thank you very much. that I'm a moderator. Um, okay, so uh, we're going to begin with our first panel. Let me introduce our, our panelists. Uh, again, Sasakawa was really critical in helping to recruit uh, some, some terrific people 
uh, to help us look at this. And, and on my immediate left is uh, uh, retired Lieutenant General uh, Isobe, Koichi Isobe. Uh, he's a, uh, served in the ground self-defense forces in Japan for, for 35 years. Uh, he's now a resident fellow uh, at Harvard University's Asia Center and a senior fellow to the Asia Pacific Initiative in Tokyo. Uh, he is uh, a, a real leader uh, in Japan. I, I had the pleasure of first meeting him back in 2007, I think, when you were vice commander of the uh, new Central Readiness Force, so a brand new force that the ground self-defense forces were, were putting together, and, and General Isobe was, was chosen to help, help lead that team. He also served twice in the Joint Staff Office, um, uh, once I think at the, as the J-5, and then also as uh, uh, Vice uh, Chief of Staff uh, at the Joint Staff Office. So he's, he's seen the, the defense uh, uh, establishment from a couple of different uh, vantage points. Thank you for coming down from, from Harvard. And then also from uh, Boston uh, today, uh, Eric Higginbotham, uh, my far left. Uh, it's great to have Eric here. He's a Principal Research Scientist at MIT's Center for International Studies, uh, a real authority on regional security issues, comes at this with both an expertise in China uh, and in Japan. Uh, also uh, worked as a senior political scientist for several years at RAND and uh, authored many of uh, their kind of seminal works uh, on these, these issues as well. So it's great to have uh, Eric with us. Thank you for, for coming down. And then Yuki Tatsumi, whom uh, I think most of you know pretty well, uh, not far from here in DC. She's the co-director uh, of the East Asia program and the director of the Japan program uh, at the Stimson Center. Uh, I think she's one of the most talented and, and uh, trusted analysts on Japanese security affairs and defense institutions. Uh, I had the pretty dog-eared copy of your book on uh, Japan's defense uh, uh, institutions, laws and organizations. Uh, so it's great to have uh, Yuki with us. Um, we're going to have two presentations, essentially, uh, to begin. Um, I'm going to begin with General Isobe, uh, since this is a Japanese product that we're, we're looking at. Uh, and, then, um, and then Yuki will, will serve kind of as a discussant and commentator uh, after that, and that will launch us into a little bit of a discussion up here before we turn it over to uh, audience. Uh, so, uh, General Isobe, let me give you the yeah. floor. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Koichi Sobe. Uh, Happy New Year. And I'm very much uh, delighted to be here. And I, it is a very honor to me uh, to be here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, both the Carnegie Endowment and the Sasakawa uh, USA. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to talk about the operational aspect of this uh, guidelines and from uh, three perspectives. One is the key challenges we are facing now. And is facing now, and uh, how uh, the guidelines addresses to the challenges, and, the, and the finally, uh, my personal recommendations to implement uh, these guidelines. So first, uh, on August 29 uh, last year, Prime Minister Abe uh, held the first meeting uh, of the advisory panel uh, on the defense uh, defense guidelines, defense uh, gui national defense program guidelines. And he said, uh, quote, uh, the security environment of Japan is becoming severer and increasingly uncertain at a pace faster than was expected five years ago. We need to identify an I ideal form of defense capabilities rather than developing them along the current path, unquote. So let me try to interpret uh, Prime Minister Abe's words, becoming severer and increasingly uncertain, in my words. So oh, look at the map slide. Uh, the most prominent feature of Japan's geography is that Japan occupies the 3,500 3, kilometers or 2,200 miles arc-shaped island chain of the east coast of the Eurasian continent. And this 2,200 miles means that uh, from the northern tip of the main state to the Key West. So you can imagine how wide the geographical expansion is. The Japanese archipelago is strategically situated in the position or line that controls exits toward the Pacific Ocean uh, from the Eurasian continent. Based on this geographical feature, 
historically, Japan has always paid attention to three geostrat uh, strategic fronts, the North, the Korean Peninsula, and the Southwestern Islands. Uh, since the Meiji Restoration, Japan's strategy has focused on one strategic front, while others are holding. Japan has been interacting with neighboring countries using a bilateral relationship. However, since the 2010s, all three fronts have become increasingly tense. Simultaneously, Japan has never experienced such a situation before. And the second challenge is new emerging threats in non-traditional domains. One is the space and the cyber or electronic magnetic threats. These threats have specific features, invisible, borderless, instance, grave impact on daily social life. Cyber attacks directed at the critical infrastructure, supply chains, IoT, and fintech, including cryptocurrencies have occurred daily, daily, both inside and outside Japan. The government of Japan uh, cybersecurity strategy, uh, it's a document, points out serious impacts may occur, not only for governmental bodies and critical infrastructure operators, but for other business and even industrial individuals, unquote. In addition to these challenges, it is uh, appropriate to point out the third challenge. Uh, it is an, uh, uh, diverse natural disasters. It's a mega earthquake, and the typhoon is uh, becoming uh, stronger and stronger. And uh, in 2011, the world witnessed the huge earthquake and unprecedented waves of tsunami in eastern Japan. Actually, statistics shows that 20% uh, of worldwide earthquakes with 6.0 Richter scale or above occur in Japan, and 7% of active volcanoes of the world exist in Japan. A response to these natural disasters is one of the major roles of the self-defense. So, uh, let me show you this one. Uh, the people in Japan share a similar view toward the exponentially increasing military tensions uh, surrounding Japan. The latest public opinion survey of 2018 marks the highest six, uh, 86 point, which means 86% of the responders think that Japan might be involved in an armed conflict in the future. And during the 20th century, such concern had been around 50% or so, but has gr gradually increased to 80% or more in the 21st century. Second, uh, how well does the new proposed guideline uh, addresses those issues? I think the new guidelines uh, has three basic ideas, principles, in how Japan should respond to these challenges. One is from temporal perspective, the guideline stresses seamless response to any crisis or contingencies. In other words, Japan would respond to challenges from peacetime to gray zone and then to conflict. Second, from spatial perspective, Japan would respond to not only traditional domains, but also new emerging domains. Furthermore, the self-defense force would respond to these challenges in a manner of cross-domain operations. Third, the guideline attaches importance on the whole government approach. These three features vividly highlight the new guidelines. Uh, let me show you another one slide. Uh, this chart shows the comparison of the previous guidelines and the new guidelines of the words joint, space, cyber, or operation referred in the guidelines. These diagrams clearly indicate that the number of words space and uh, cyber referred in the new guidelines uh, become threefold compared to the previous one. Okay. 
So what the key priorities for implementing implementation for the new guidelines? I think I have three uh, pillars uh, from my perspective. One is a further improvement of the joint operational posture. And the second is the strengthen the US-Japan alliance. And third is strengthen the Southwestern Islands defense posture. The first one, further improve the joint operational posture. Uh, this is mainly the establishment of the permanent or uh, regular or standard uh, joint uh, headquarters. From an operational pers perspective, it is a little bit disappointing that the guidelines does not touch upon the establishment of the permanent joint headquarters. It simply notes to, unquote, study, uh, quote, uh, study how to integrate operations in the future, unquote. Based on the lessons learned from the Great Eastern Japan disaster of 2011, it is obvious that the Cell Defense Force needed a permanent joint headquarters. At present, the Japanese Joint Chief interacts with three counterparts of the U.S. military leaders. Uh, Pentagon's uh, Joint Chief, Hawaii's uh, indo uh Commander, and Yokota's uh, USFJ, U.S. Forces Japan's Commander. And when crises occur, it is almost impossible for him to discuss and respond to both political, military, and operational issues simultaneously. If the PJHQ were established in the Self-Defense Force, it could become a real counterpart of the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command from operational perspective. So the second uh, issue, challenges, uh, recommendations is to strengthen the U.S.-Japan alliance. Uh, four points. One. The SDF should strengthen the operational linkage with the U.S. Uh, indo pacom Command. As no noted before, the SDF command and control structure should be aligned to the one of indo pacom Second, the development of bilateral operation plans in every possible scenario, ranging from peacetime to gray zone, gray zone to conflict. This is critical for both prevention and bilateral actions and eventually for the stability of the Northeast Asia. The other point is, as the Third Defense Force is going to introduce many U.S. weapons systems, such as Aegis Ashore, F-35B, Global Hawk, etc., so drastic improvement of interoperability is urgent especially in the areas of command and control. Fourth point, the Self-Defense Force and the indo pacom can work more closely together toward forming a regional corporate, cooperative effort, such as coordinated operations in East and South China Seas, capacity building efforts in Indo-Pacific region, and deepening the relationship with like-minded countries such as Australia and India. My third uh, recommendation is to strengthen the Southwestern Islands defense. Uh, the government of Japan uh, should develop an overall strategy how to secure the Southwestern Island chain. As the guidelines stress stresses the importance of the whole government approach and the seamless approach in securing the Southwestern Islands sovereignty, the government needs to strengthen these kinds of approaches. Guidelines reiterates, quote, the government shall make integrated efforts with not only the Ministry of Defense and the Self-Defense Force, but also with relevant agencies, local organizations, and private organizations, and shall build up a defense system that integrates the, cap the capability of Japan, unquote. It is high time uh, for the government to develop comprehensive Southwestern Islands security strategy, inviting not only the MOD or Self-Defense Force, but also other relevant agencies such as the Coast Guard and the police. This effort would surely enhance the seamless response to provocations. To ensure the defense posture of this region, collaboration with the U.S. forces is also encouraged, such as bilateral patrol and exercises. Uh, second 
Second point is the Self Defense Force is going to introduce uh, various weapon systems, as mentioned before, and also including uh, adding such as UAV and UUV, uh, surface to surface missile system, and many things. So to align these various weapon systems into the same direction for same objective, uh, the Self Defense Force, especially the Joint Staff, shall develop a doctrine to deter and fight in this theater. In this theater, furthermore, joint operational posture is indispensable for the Southwestern Islands defense. Lastly, as pointed out in the guideline, uh, those areas of resiliency of defense structures, rapid runway recovery capabilities, and designating alternative, uh, alternate military airfields, securing lines of communication to remote islands, stockpiling uh, ammunition are critically important for the sustainable operations. So this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, General Isobe. That's a terrific uh, way to get us started and uh, a full overview. Um, Eric, let me uh, give you a chance to follow that up. Great, thanks Jim and uh, the other Jim and Carnegie and uh, the Sasakawa Foundation for convening this, Sayuri-san. That was a terrific overview we got from General Isobe. Uh, I'll provide a US perspective on the NDPG, uh, but let me emphasize here that this is an American view. It's absolutely not the American view. In fact, I, I would guess I'm uh, in the mi minority on some of the points that I'll make today. Um, I'll also not speak as General Isobe did uh, sort of uh, according to the sequence of the document or necessarily what gets most ink in the document. Uh, rather, I'll just highlight some of, the, some of the aspects that might otherwise be missed. Uh, I'd start by saying that in many ways I found the, the 2018 documents, so it's the, it's the NDPG, it's also the midterm defense uh, plan as well as the budget for next year. I found these documents uh, dramatic, uh, perhaps startling. Uh, they contain a number of significant adjustments uh, as well as a few conspicuous holes. Uh, in, in my comments, I'll, I'll divide my time into three parts. First, I'll discuss uh, some of the strategic challenges facing Japan, primarily the high-end uh, military problem on which the NDPG does seem to focus. Uh, second, I'll spend the bulk of my time highlighting some select aspects uh, of these documents, uh, some strengths and weaknesses, and third, uh, outline some outstanding questions or points that we might consider in, in Q&A or going forward. Uh, starting with the military challenge, I don't know if we have the slides up. Uh, oh, oh, I thought you weren't going to use them. Okay, I um, won't use slides. That's fine. You wanted to use the, the image <laughs> I sent some, yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't okay. specify, but um, uh, starting with the, uh, with the military challenge, the guidelines highlight uh, in particular dramatic improvements to Chinese conventional military capabilities. So for the first time, this document places the China challenge or the China threat above uh, North Korea. Um, so I'll focus on that uh, in my comments. China today spends about three and a half times as much as Japan on its military. That's a big change. As late as 2000, Japan was spending more than China on its military. So an enormous, very rapid change in terms of uh, military spending. And the Chinese capabilities are catching up to those budget figures. So China launched six destroyers in 2018 compared to, I think, two for the United States. And and one for Japan, and these are very large ships. In fact, some of them are larger than uh, US destroyers. Secondly, uh, Japan and China do contest territory, the Senkaku Islands, as well as the boundary line, the midpoint line between the two, the maritime uh, boundary line. That aside, the two could also be drawn into other regional conflicts over, for example, Taiwan or the South China Sea, given that the US base is in Japan and their possible participation in other regional conflicts. Uh, third, uh, the U.S. and Japan enjoy important military advantages, at least in the qualitative sense, but geography works against uh, the alliance in many ways. U.S. reinforcements are thousands of miles away. Hawaii alone is 4,000 miles from Japan. Um, and within the theater, some of Japan's outer islands are not only small, but they're closer to China than they are to major bases in Japan. So if you look at, uh, I think, Yaki is something on the order of uh, 400 kilometers from China, but it's 500 miles, I'm sorry, 500 kilometers from Okinawa and fully 1,000 from Kyushu. Um, and that puts it uh, within a range of uh, China's major bases. Um, 
<coughs> and then fourth, uh, these islands, especially the outer islands, but all of Japan are within range of uh, numerous and highly accurate Chinese ballistic and cruise missiles. So uh, China's been modernizing the full range of capabilities and has, has modern and substantial capabilities in all domains, but this missile threat is particularly uh, significant and severe. Not only are, are they large in number, but they're highly accurate. So where does that leave us with the NDPG and the midterm defense plan in terms of uh, Japan's response? Uh, again, I'll not walk, walk through it point by point, uh, but as far as uh, positive elements, I'd highlight some of the things that General Lee Sobe just talked about. First of all, there's a real uh, focus on resilience, the ability to absorb attack and continue to operate. Uh, if there were a conflict, uh, Japanese forces would comprise the bulk of the, the allied forces forward deployed, and they would be subject to attack. So in a protracted fight, of course, the U.S. forces would flow forward, but it would take them weeks to get there, and they'd be dependent on having functioning infrastructure and a viable ally, a viable force in being uh, when they got there. So the NDPG outlines three elements uh, of resilience, dispersion, recovery, and redundance, or, or substitution. It outlines a number of specific points, more munitions to keep the fight going, mobility and the ability to plug gaps in the lines that might, that might emerge, the use of more facilities, including civilian ones, uh, the use of what they call stovel aircraft. These are short landing and takeoff aircraft the F-35B uh, is discussed in the documents, and forward positioning uh, and hardening of, of supplies, particularly, again, in the Southwest Island chain, uh, far from uh, even Japanese reinforcement or support. A second element of the document that I'd highlight is in maritime lift. Again, we could look at this as a, an element of resilience, but it's probably worth some specific mention. There are new types of, sh new classes of ships, new classes of transport in the document, uh, LSVs and LCUs. Um, and Japan also intends to strengthen what amounts to a civilian reserve fleet uh, financed by private finance initiatives. So it's a combined sort of civilian government effort. These would be civilian ships in peacetime, but could be mobilized. And I think it, in a way this signifies uh, my next point, which is the focus on cost effectiveness and a, and a mixed sort of high-low strategy here. Uh, so really, I think for the first time, we see a focus on getting the most for their budget. It doesn't apply to all areas of the document. I think there's some significant exceptions, but there is a lot more emphasis on this in the document overall. Uh, it recognizes that Japan can't outspend its potential adversaries. Just give a few examples here, again, of this mixed high-low strategy. The Navy will continue to produce high-end uh, Aegis-equipped destroyers but it will supplement this with much cheaper multi-purpose uh, so-called compact hull ships, really frigates, uh, and it's also introducing a new class of 1,000 ton, very small, uh, patrol ships, which may take up some of the slack or some of the burden of the so-called gray zone conflict and allow the, the main force to focus on high-end problems and, and training and readiness. Fourth uh, aspect of the document that I think deserves highlighting is just across the board improvements to air and maritime uh, capabilities. Some highlights there, uh, th th there's an expansion of the number of F-35s to be purchased. Now uh, they're intending to re replace the entire, th th that part of the F-15 fleet which cannot be updated, modernized. So it'll be about 100 F-15s that will be replaced with F-35s. Uh, they're also making a very substantial purchase of E-2Ds, airborne warning and command and control aircraft, uh, doubling the size of the tanker fleet with the addition of four additional uh, airborne tankers. Um, there's a caveat, I think, to all of this. Uh, this needs to be kept in perspective. China is modernizing its force and increasing the size of its military inventories. China, uh, Japan is effectively modernizing its forces selectively, but can't really afford to expand them in any substantial way. All right, let me just make a few comments about uh, what's missing or what might be particularly prominent questions that emerge from the document. Um, first, I just can't emphasize enough Generally, Sobe's main point that uh, the document does disappoint on the issue of jointness. Uh, there's rhetorical emphasis, as we saw from Generally Sobe's slides, on jointness in the document, and two small joint elements are established, cyber and maritime lift. Uh, but overall, jointness is, is not adequately discussed, and neither is there a uh, standing uh, or permanent joint command, uh, as some thought there might be, but there's not also a uh, 
a joint planning office and the joint staff uh, office, which some thought there would be. Uh, this is obviously a big problem. Not only do each of the services have a different number of sort of theaters, Japan is divided into, into different commands. Each of the services has a different number of commands and they actually bisect each other fairly neatly. So that was one of my slides, but in any case, it's, a, it's an interesting situation. All, it looks almost intentional. Um, so none of this is addressed in the document. Uh, a second issue, uh, and here with apologies to General Isobe, uh, I, I'm a ground force officer, at least in history in the reserves as ground force officer, but I will say a second prominent uh, issue with the, with the NDPG is what I would call uh, this continuing uh, Japan's imperial army. That is, it's the army's dominance within Japan's military system. The ground self-defense force, the overall budget is uh, something like 68% uh, for 2019. The, the overall, the ground force budget is 68% larger than that of the Air Force. It's 50 plus percent larger than that of the Navy, uh, which just to me doesn't make sense for a maritime for, for an island state, for an archipelagic state facing primarily mar, air and maritime threats. Why is this an issue? I mean, apart from the obvious, uh, the GSDF consistently gets what it wants, including uh, fairly expensive and new toys, while the other services uh, often have to make, I think, inadequate compromises. So the F-15 fleet is being modernized, but even those jets which which are undergoing modernization are just being upgraded in their mechanical radar. They are not getting phased array radar, which are pretty much de rigueur in most air forces. So uh, Japan's fourth generation jets will not be as modern as the Chinese uh, fourth generation uh, aircraft that they might be facing. I guess the second point on this is just that the GSDF also seems to have an outsized say in military strategy and concepts of operation. So we see this in the emphasis in these documents and other documents as well in retaking captured islands and maybe less than is deserved on achieving air and maritime superiority. So these get lip service, they're certainly mentioned, but uh, th those are prerequisites to any effort to recapture lost islands and I think in many ways much more important and should come first. Finally, the most important set of questions surrounding the documents is, uh, is the number and type of offensive systems that are, that Japan is pursuing. And I guess this, when I said this, these documents are somewhat startling, I, this is primarily what I was referring to. First of all, uh, th there is a major emphasis on standoff strike. We knew that would be the case. Uh, Japan is purchasing a Norwegian missile ground and maritime attack missile with a range of about 550 kilometers. It's also purchasing the US uh, JASM ER extended range with a range of about 900 kilometers, the El Rasm, a maritime strike missile. There's also a, a hypersonic boost glide system in the document uh, that looks an awful lot like a ballistic missile during the launch phase. Say that again, it looks a lot like a ballistic missile. That's fairly dramatic in the launch phase. Um, and then uh, uh, down the road, a hypersonic cruise missile uh, propelled by a scramjet as well, assuming they can do all that technically. It's also, uh, as generally so being discussed, there's a very heavy emphasis in the, in the document overall on cyber and space. That, of course, is a good thing. Um, included in each of those categories is offensive offensive capabilities. So there's offensive cyber mentioned in the document. There will also be offensive space. Uh, my translation of that particular sentence, to assure proper function of space systems and an ability to, to disrupt adversary command control and intelligence, Japan will strengthen its ability to secure advantage in the use of space. So again, uh, in the use of space. Again, I think that's a fairly dramatic uh, statement and a fairly dramatic development. And then finally, the conversion of DDH is these helicopter carriers into, into sometimes aircraft carriers. Uh, that, uh, Japan may place F-35Bs onto the Numo class uh, destroyers sometimes. Uh, okay, so uh, why is this an issue? Um, these are all discussed in terms of the defense of the islands. Uh, and I'm certainly not suggesting that uh, 
that Japan has any intent or capability to wage offensive war. But uh, they're clearly operationally offensive systems. Uh, some of the capabilities are clearly designed to attack adversary bases and facilities, not, for example, adversary positions on occupied islands. The longest range Chinese air defense systems have a range of 400 kilometers, and that's against high-flying aircraft. Against low-flying aircraft, it might be about 100 kilometers. And again, the JASM ER is a system with a range of 1,000 kilometers. It's three times as expensive as, as cruise missiles with shorter range, say 300 to 400 kilometers. Uh, <coughs> the U.S. has uh, presumably approved these systems, or most of these systems, uh, certainly the ones that come from the United States. But U.S. policymakers, to include senior U.S. military officials, will now, in an emergency, have to concern themselves with escalatory potential. Of course, Japan will, too. This all depends on the circumstances uh, and, and the specific targets. But nevertheless, escalation becomes a bigger issue. And apart from the escalation issue, uh, there are new coordination requirements here, especially on the space and cyber side. Those are two areas where, uh, where secrecy is rather extreme and our ability to share information is very limited. Um, our national interests in the use of offensive cyber and space may not always align. And again, sharing that granular information on specific, say, vulnerabilities or exploits in the case of cyber will be difficult. So you can imagine cases where, say, one side is exploiting a vulnerability to gather intelligence on an adversary system and may not want that system attacked, but it may not be able to communicate that to, to its ally. Uh, finally, there are some questions about the center of gravity in Japanese military strategy. I'll leave that for Q&A. Um, just close with a few thoughts uh, to reiterate. First, there's a lot to celebrate in the documents. Japan is clearly much more serious about generating real military capabilities and using its funds, you know, using its limited defense resources to maximum effect. Uh, secondly, there are uh, some outstanding problems, particularly in the area of jointness, um, as well as a whole number of questions that really haven't been terribly well addressed, I don't think, in the media. Um, Third, uh, you know, we should probably also address flaws on the U.S. side. This is a meeting about Japan, so I haven't done that here, but we should certainly acknowledge that the U.S. Uh, has its foibles uh, and flaws with regard to strategy and, uh, and concepts. Um, on the other hand, we really shouldn't give anyone a pass here, uh, given the challenges that, that the alliance faces. Um, and then finally, as we think about our options for responding to the various military challenges that we do face, uh, in addition to operational efficacy, which I spent most of my time on, and I think also think about crisis stability. No, no, not at all. Not at all. Thank you. No, thank you, Eric. That's a very sophisticated analysis, and I apologize for the lack of slides. Uh, that was uh, my, my misunderstanding. But uh, those slides we can put up on the event page of the website, um, so they'll be uh, available to, to access to, to everybody. Um, so uh, sorry for the, the delay on that front. Um, there, all right, you've already stimulated a whole lot of questions uh, for me between our first two presentations, but Yuki, you get the first uh, chance to kind of follow up and weigh in here. Thank you, Jim, and uh, good morning, everyone. And I would like to also thank uh, Carnegie and uh, Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA for giving me this opportunity. It's always exciting to uh, come back here to speak about the issues that I deeply care about. So. And then, but at the same time, it's a little bit intimidating to follow um, follow after uh, these uh, two really excellent presentations. But I, what I think I will end up doing is um, pile on to the list of questions that uh, Jim already had accumulated. So we will have a lot to talk about in Q and A. Um, so just to just to set in a context, uh, National Defense Program guidelines and uh, Midterm Defense Program, those two set of documents are supposed to be read together. Um, as a package, um, the way I describe it to America, my uh, American friends about ND, um, NDPG is it's quasi quadrennial defense review-ish document. I would say ish because QDR is really more about setting the strategic context and uh, talk about lay out the uh, framework within which national national defense strategy and military strategies are formed, whereas NDPG does a little bit of both. It talks a little bit about policy. And then 
kind of try to set the uh, overall defense posture framework under that. And midterm defense program is really a um, very close, some, again, a five-year defense plan document-ish document that that is essentially an acquisition target over the uh, next four to five years. So that's why these two documents, one of them more heavy on a policy and, and the other one very, very heavy on the acquisition side are, are, are need to be read together to get the full flavor of it, but only a handful of us will either enjoy doing it or have the time to do it. And uh, I'm not going to uh, go through all these documents and uh, granular details about um, what those are. But a um, couple of the thing is um, it is very customary for NDPG to come up with its own uh, coined phrase for the uh, image vision of the defense force that, uh, that, um, that that the document aspires to. And in this time, it is, I think, what, what can be translated as a joint mobile defense force is probably the most accurate translation that I come up with because I haven't seen yet on the MOD website English translation of the document. That's why everybody was kind of wondering about it. A um, couple of the, uh, a couple of the uh, repeated theme come through very strongly from this document. Um, General Isobe already touched upon it. It's sustainability, resiliency, and comprehend, um, comprehensive and also optimization, which talks greatly about um, cost efficiency or cost effectiveness that uh, Erica talked, um, spent, spent time on. And uh, three features which may not necessarily get a lot of media attention, but the one that I, I personally noticed particularly interesting was, first is the, um, this got a little bit of attention because of the uh, implications of, of the, uh, um, implications to the standing policy, but identification of uh, space and cyberspace and uh, electronic man magnetic waves as the uh, future areas of uh, focused investment. Secondly, I think this NDPG is really the first document that openly acknowledged that the true transformation is required for self-defense forces to have a truly effective and um, fightable force. Thirdly, um, there this document is, I think, also, I mean, first in identifying a couple of the capability or capacity as the joint um, joint assets. Maritime transport is one, and uh, I believe the space was the other. And uh, both uh, General Sylvia and Eric talked about the uh, lack of a kind of a deep dive or further discussion on the jointness. But I would also, um, I, I would also suggest that uh, Maritime transport or uh, ground self defense forces uh, taking over the uh, operation of Aegis Ashore, those can actually be the uh, in, um, effectively the forcing function of a fur uh, fur further jointness. And uh, that's how actually Japan's uh, self defense forces jointness has always progressed, that it's not based on the law, it's not based on the internal guideline, it's really that service getting these uh, specific new missions that force them to go join. And I would see that um, not this may not happen in the short term, but over time I can see those new, new functions or new acquisitions that are um, identified under these two documents can serve as additional forcing functions toward, toward jointness. It still does not resolve the um, operational issues um, that uh, General Isobe highlighted, but um, it, is, it is something to, be, uh, to consider. Um, Eric talked uh, greatly about the uh, um, challenges that he sees um, in the NDPG from operational perspective, but let me pile on a little bit more, which is actually really critical when you, when you really think through how to operationalize this great vision that uh, has been much celebrated in this document. This is nothing new. Budget, I keep saying budget, 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 um, is the, uh, critical area of challenge that I see. Um, budget is a budget uh, increase that Japan has seen under Prime Minister Abe. It has, it has taken an uptick, but it's still very incremental. And the size of the new acquisitions that the new uh, midterm defense program outlines, I don't think uh, this uh, incremental budget increase will catch up uh, uh, keep up the pace with the uh, actual uh, financial require uh, resource requirements to bring this all about. 
And Japan has always had the problem when it comes to these acquisition and execution of this midterm defense program, what's known as, um, in Japanese, is konendo futang, or konendo okuri, basically passing the buck to the further fiscal, further out fiscal years. So first and second fiscal years of um, that's covered under a midterm defense program, they try to stay within that, but then basically all the remaining balance, it's kind of like a credit card. You know, you pay what you can, but then at some point you have to pay the balance. And the balance tends to get much more, m much bigger than the actual budget can sustain. And Japan has chronically had that problem in the defense acquisition. I can see that um, only worsening with this new list of acquisition and the already existing standing, ac new standing acquisition that Japan is already grappling with, including 20 acquisition of 24 um, F-35A, um, Osprey, um, E2D, so on and so forth. These are all really high priced um, items. So it really, it really has to be resourced a little bit more robustly, but I just don't see the scenario where that can be possible. And what's particularly problematic is, um, as we all know, Prime Minister Abe has been probably the very strong, most one of the strongest advocate for robust Japanese defense force. Um, he's, he's a very strong leadership style, made a lot of the things what was considered impossible happen. But in the middle of this uh, midterm defense program execution, his time in the office will end. So we will be in like a mid of like year two or beginning of the year three of the defense program when Prime Minister Abe gets taken over by his successor. So uh, depending on the personality and leadership style and the political environment that Japan faces at that time, um, government may have, government um, battle to defend these budget figures can be, can be an extremely uphill battle. So I would just uh, highlight that. But then, when, but then why is this important? Because when the budget battle happens, um, their budget battle is primarily driven by their sense of urgency to um, keep the budget for acquisition. So what gets bartered down is intangible but yet critical to keep the readiness of this force, which is personnel-related co personnel costs, education and training, repair and maintenance, purchase of the spare parts, and purchase a lot of the smaller items that often doesn't get the attention. So I, I would just throw that out as one big problem that I see. And then also, um, also look, looking down the road, I really think that the post-Abe um, political environment can either make it easier or harder to execute these um, vision that's laid out here. So without going into, a, I'm, I'm happy to go into more granular details during the Q&A, but I'll just stop at that. That's great, thank you, Yuki, that's excellent. Um, yeah, I think we have a, a, a good picture now of how important this, uh, this step is, albeit maybe it's incremental or evolutionary, it's still quite uh, an important step and commitment that Japan is making, uh, some very uh, uh, positive, uh, kind of encouraging aspects to it, especially from an alliance context and, and uh, grappling with some of the challenges that Japan faces, uh, but not without uh, its own challenges, shortcomings, um, and, uh, and, and possible second guessing. Uh, we can do a little arm, uh, Monday, Monday morning quarterback uh, armchair uh, criticism here. Uh, but I'd like to begin the, the discussion, um, a lot of different directions we can go in, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick four basic questions to start off, and this is open for, for anybody here. I'll, I'll do them one at a time. Uh, but the first is kind of a basic question about, um, we've all followed these NDPGs in the past, and uh, generally, Sobe, you, you've experienced it kind of internally. Um, what, how would you describe the track record uh, in the past or the impact of a, of a new revised NDPG in terms of how that ends up impacting on operations, capabilities, et cetera. What, what should we, what's, what's the track record on the, the, uh, the importance in, in real terms over the next few years for, for this kind of a, uh, 
So on that one, track record may not um, be um, accurate way to describe it, but I think, for example, I think a 1995 um, NDPG um, put a ballistic missile defense front and center of uh, Japan's uh, defense investment and a policy priority. And that forced a lot of things, a lot of internal changes. Um, top of that list was jointness. And we, we all kind of criticized about how um, jointness um, lacks attention in this, this time's NDPG. But I also have to point out that, that you know, Japan has been at this jointness business only for 20 years, um, whereas like we in the United States have been at it since the passage of the Goldwater Nichols. So of course it is kind of easier for us to criticize like what's missing, what's not. Um, Japan is really sh um, at it for a shorter period of time, but then, and then without these forcing function, which is called legislation, it managed to come quite a long way in this, uh, in since uh, since uh, this whole notion of jointness started. Of course, there's still area that needs needs and requires improvement. But so I would I would probably highlight um, something like that, like a BMD introduction of BMD into um, in the 1995 NDPG, and also um, 2013 NDPG actually started this process of shift in defense posture from what has been um, predicated upon countering the mass land invasion from the north into the uh, island uh, defense of the uh, remote islands or island chain, which again also forced a lot of changes in operational, co um, operational concept, the way that especially the ground force thinks of themselves in terms of how they move in the times of contingency. And you can see that in the real, in a real world where traditionally, you know, Japan's ground self defense force have obviously a lot to do with army, but this introduction of amphibious capability really pushed forward ground self defense forces cooperation with Marine Corps on the US side. And now I would say they probably have, um, my army colleague will be really pissed off at me when I say this, but I think Japanese ground self defense force has probably more um, training together, um, dialogue together in terms of their capabilities and such with Marines than the Army who is stationed in Japan. So those are some of the, I guess, impact that uh, that this uh, NDPG, like a past NDPG mm -hmm. has. No, no, that's, that's, that's what we want to begin to get at. Thank you very much. Uh, great question. And before that, uh, I'd like to a little bit about the fact of the ground set. Uh, I'm not a representative of the ground self-defense force, <laughs> <laughs> but I was in the uh, ground self force, but also served in uh, twice at uh, Joint Staff. I think I have a little bit. Uh, and about the ground self-defense force, I think uh, it is uh, transforming drastically right now. During the Cold War, it is very heavy forces. Uh, they had uh, 1,200 uh, uh, tanks and artilleries listed. But now they are reducing it to the 300 tanks and 300 artillery pieces means almost equivalent to the one uh, armored division of the US. All the big uh, island chains uh, we will have only 300 but a uh, practical feature 2,000 2,200 miles uh, the ground forces should be up deployed in these areas effectively because of responding to the emergencies and the natural disasters like that. Okay, so uh, finish my present uh, explanation of the ground self force. And uh, actually the defense guidelines, I had been involved in this uh, development process 
uh, for almost every uh, gadget. Five, I was an additional count. 2003, uh, as an uh, chief of the program and policy division of the board. Then 2013, I was. So I have seen the guidelines and I have been involved in that. And the very peculiar, unique characteristics of this guideline is that the guideline was developed uh, after the establishment of the National Security National Security Secretariat was uh, established in January 2014. And the former guideline was established just one month ago, one month before. So I think uh, it is important for the government to process of this guideline, uh, how, to what extent the National Security Secretariat uh, was involved. And uh, so this is my observation, uh, very personal, but uh, I think this guideline is quite different from the previous ones. So this guideline is like a guiding instrument for the Defense Force and the Ministry of Defense. So the important thing is how to implement basic ideas of the guidelines. Very important for the self-defense force. Thanks, that is a great question. Uh, for, let me just start with my answer by saying that the Japanese pro planning process and all, all of the guidelines are probably followed better than their counterparts on the U.S. side. There tend to be more stops and starts on the U.S. side. I don't, don't think I'm going out on a limb and saying that. There are more actors heavily involved in the U.S. side, Congress, for example, with their own interests. Um, also, I, the second point is just that these things can be updated along the way in the, in the Japanese uh, case as well. So uh, I went back after reading the, 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 the two major uh, documents and the budget, I went back and I read the 2018 budget. In fact, I found that a number of things I thought were new in the NDPG were, in fact, already in the budget for 2018. So, you know, some of what I said was new isn't actually new. But <laughs> in any case, this one, too, can be amended, and we all hope that there'll be more specific concrete measures for jointness down the road, for example. Uh, then the, the two other points that have already been made, I just want to footstop those. First of all, I, I can't emphasize enough how important it is that the NSC had the lead on this document. So this was Mr. Yachi. Uh, you know, as head of, head of the NSC and his th three subordinates from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Diplomat Staff Office, and uh, the, the MOD. And, uh, you know, this this is important because it represents a new potential avenue, and I think in this case one that was seized for s central control anyway. We don't have jointness within the military, but this is sort of a, a central political leading organ that can be used to, to achieve greater coherence overall in the defense effort. Um, uh, you know, lots of questions there about how effective that will be, particularly going forward once uh, Prime Minister Abe leaves office, um, but in any case, an important development. Uh, and then finally, maybe relatedly, you know, perhaps on the downside, again, uh, as I went through the document too, I had a similar concern to, 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 to <coughs> Yuki's that um, can they actually fund all this going forward? So. Um, you know, it's a very ambitious document, and it's not clear to me that it can all be funded. Thanks. Um, so for the sake of time, I'm going to cut one of my questions, so I'm down to just two more. Uh, but it builds a little bit on this question about affordability and also sticking with our operational theme. Um, there's a big commitment to F-35 in this NDPG, a midterm defense plan, uh, an additional 105 uh, F-35s uh, to be purchased. Um, 40 or so of those will be these F-35Bs, the Stovall type that um, can really utilize the different uh, smaller runways and maybe localities uh, uh, in, throughout the island chain that, that uh, I could see some real operational benefit in terms of flexibility there, but also this idea of being able to use them on uh, these helicopter destroyers in a, in a kind of a quasi-aircraft carrier mode uh, when 
been needed. Um, so my, my question goes to what do you think about this, this big bet on the F-35s in terms of budget? They're right now buying about six a year for $130 million uh, a piece. Um, if, even if you ramp that up to 10 or 12 a year at a 110, 100 million, if you can get to that point, that's a, a 10, 12 year, uh, $10 billion uh, commitment, a significant chunk of Japan's aircraft acquisition budget will be dedicated uh, to one type. Um, uh, so in terms of the role that the fighter plays in Japan's defense strategy, I'm, I'm curious about, about your thoughts. Uh, so kind of from a budget perspective or an operational perspective, um, surprised to see this, this this large number, or does this really kind of make sense to, to make Japan's uh, fighter seat uh, be as, as capable as possible? Start on that. Um, it's a fantastic question. I haven't thought enough about it, but I will say uh, I was. I was surprised just because of the number and the cost. Um, but from a different perspective, I think it makes it does make sense. Uh, first of all, I, I think the most important, the most pressing high-end challenge that Japan does face is this this air missile, this integrated air and missile threat. Uh, you know, it's, it's a ballistic missile threat. Again, these are very highly accurate ballistic missiles. There's a cruise missile threat, and then there's there's actually an aircraft threat here as well. And these can be combined in uh, in various ways, but. China now operates 850 fourth generation aircraft, and that number, at least in recent years, has been going up by, I think, close to 100 aircraft per year. Japan operates something like 280-odd uh, combat aircraft, maybe 250 fourth gen aircraft. And as I said, some of those are actually, you know, they're really baseline fourth generation aircraft, whereas some of China's are sort of fourth gen plus. So th this is a pressing problem. The F-35 fills a number of functions, obviously air defense against you know, air attacks. It also provides the cruise missile defense. So I mentioned ballistic and cruise missiles. There are many more cruise missiles than there are ballistic missiles in China's inventory. So these can be put up to screen against cruise missile threat. Uh, they're highly capable aircraft. Um, you know, it's been controversial in the US. Uh, it, it is controversial. I'll add a couple of caveats here or our question marks, um, you know, they're very expensive. We also don't really know yet how much they're going to cost to maintain. Some numbers have been bandied about, but it's unclear to me how, how firm those are. These could be a lot more expensive to maintain than, uh, than we've heard to date. Um, the other issue is uh, basing. So F-35 in particular makes sense, as Jim said, because they can operate off shorter runways, maybe off some of these smaller runways in Japan. If Japan can dis disperse its forces at the outset of a conflict, uh, they'll be a lot more secure against, uh, against the air and missile threat. Um, but it needs to do that. Otherwise, these things are just targets sitting on runways. So it really, really needs to work the resilience problem. The U.S. Air Force has exactly the same problem. I think it's found religion now. Um, so it went from sort of testing some new operational concepts, this dis dispersed operational concepts. These were experimental a few years ago. Now they finally have a, a name that might stick, ACE, Agile Combat Employment. And this is actually doctrine now, at least in uh, the Pacific and PACOM uh, uh, Air Force. Um, but Japan will certainly have to make them make them survivable. And again, now uh, the, the F-35B, I do think that's one that makes particular sense. Both operating off the, you know, smaller air bases down in the south and off the carriers. There's been a lot of attention to the carrier as an offensive capability, and I did have that in my list. But actually, I think that in some ways is the least offensive capability of the ones that I mentioned, because these things can sit behind the island chain and provide an additional layer of air defense on bases that are difficult. You know, they're moving bases. They're hard to find and, and hard to destroy. They're not invulnerable. But I think it makes sense as an extra layer of air defense. Uh, from the operational perspective, uh, F-35s, uh, especially B, uh, is a great thing. with the naval intelligence. But the issue is that the 
as Yuki-san criticizes that the uh, budget is a defense, self-defense force are purchasing many new weapon systems and equipment. How can we? Budget is the most important thing. Um, let me quickly throw an ad additional zinger at this, which is that um, we're already surprised and try to figure out how to fund the uh, additional uh, additional purchase of the F-35. May not in this midterm defense program, but then probably the one follow-on. What Japan is going to do in the for the replace replacement combat aircraft to succeed F-2 fighter mm -hmm. will come into play also, and that uh, with the with the two consecutive decision of acquisition of the system that's primarily going to be foreign military sales. Zero Japanese industrial, a very little um, industrial Japanese uh, participation platform is probably out of the question for many people in Japan, especially in the government and in the industry, for the health of the Japanese industrial base. Then what does that mean to the cost for this, what uh, um, ultimately be F2 replacement? My bet is it will be it will be just as, if not more, expensive than F-35 that they're buying because we still don't know about the exportability of that replacement aircraft. So I'll just throw it in as an additional zinger. Increase the borrowing limit there on the credit card. <laughs> if that problem. Um, a lot of interesting issues. Uh, I'm going to turn to the audience in just a minute, so prepare your, your questions. We have until, until 1030 for this session. Um, I want to sneak in, and uh, this is a sneaky, difficult question to answer quickly, but I wonder if, if, if my panel can address this idea at least briefly. Um, it's been mentioned, this idea of disruption capability in the cyber realm, in the space realm. Uh, essentially, it's, it's the a concept of using some limited offensive capability or, or uh, an ability to disrupt an enemy's uh, capacity to hurt you as a legitimate defensive uh, 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 means. Um, but it raises these questions. Eric brought up the, the issue of, of crisis stability and, and um, uh, escalation. Uh, so I, I want to ask just briefly, what are some of your key thoughts or, or areas of um, recommendation or, or things you'll be looking for in the context of how does the Japanese system, as it's currently constructed, address this idea of giving authority to employ some of these Tools. So the first, there's kind of developing the tools, but but how do they get integrated into a into an operational uh, uh, kind of practical concept? Do you have some some thoughts about how feasible or challenging that? Or, or space or electromagnetic. Um, some of these areas where the, the, the term kind of disruption, at least the English term, I don't know what the Japanese term was. But, uh, but, the, but that, that's a relatively new part of Japan's now kind of operational challenge or management in terms of how do you manage giving, giving the authority to, yes, go ahead and do that. Or will, do you think, uh, commanders in the field will have the the flexibility uh, to deal with that as they deem necessary uh, to protect themselves. You know, there are very detailed rules about um, engagement, air to air engagement, or naval air engagement, about when the use of force is delegated to the on site commander versus has to be authorized from a central point. This idea of disruption in these new domains seems to me to be a relatively uh, uh, challenging area for Japan. Uh, that's a great question. It's a tough question. Uh, I'd say it's a question that's under debate today, not just in Japan, I'm sure, but in the United States as well. So under the U.S. system, which I don't understand thoroughly, but I'll say under the U.S. system, as I do understand it, for example, cyber is very tightly centrally uh, controlled. There are senior officers in the other branches and services, you know, theater level folks who believe that 
it that the operational control should be more integrated into the into the major joint commands, for example, and and sort of parsed out at the operational level. But today it's it's held uh, centrally, I think largely for reasons of coordination, some of the things that I talked about, we don't want to step on our own feet, you know, in the cyber realm, it's quite easy to do. Um, on this, uh, in both domains, you have serious escalation issues, that may be another reason that, uh, that they're tightly held, centrally directed. Um, just to speak to that for one moment, since Jim raised it, uh, you know, it's, it's a, an issue that's gotten a lot of ink. Um, on the cyber side, you know, initially some folks thought, well, it's, it's non-lethal so in, in many cases, in most cases, so maybe it's less, uh, less escalatory. It's a measure you can take that doesn't kill someone but sends a signal, et cetera. But I, I think there's a lot of concern about escalation in the cyber domain, depending on what you do. First of all, it can be diff difficult to differentiate an operational cyber attack from a strategic cyber attack. You know, just from gaming, you can see that people often misunderstand signals that are sent, especially if they're not verbalized. If you just do something, it's, it, you know, the, I think these are often uh, misunderstood. And then, uh, and then also on the operational side, they can compromise a range of capabilities that may be regarded as, uh, you know, critical threats. So, for example, if you undertake a cyber attack, obviously, if, if it affects command and control that could impinge on nuclear capabilities, that would be an extraordinarily serious uh, measure. So I think there, there are a number of reasons why th these capabilities might be held at the central level. I'm sure this discussion is starting at Japan, but Mori Sobe knows more about where they are on that discussion. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, it's a very, very difficult uh, question to answer. So I'm wondering whether my, my answer is uh, directly answering to Jim's question, but uh, I think the Ministry of Defense and the Self-Defense Force has mainly focused on the protection of uh, uh, Self-Defense Force uh, infrastructure. But the Japan uh, is a logically very advanced society. Bullet train, Shinkansen system, power supply chain, financial services, there are many assets to protect from the cyber attacks. And the new guideline uh, advocates that the whole government approach, not only uh, Ministry of Defense, but all relevant agencies should. I don't know to what extent from now on, the Self-Defense Force or the Ministry of Defense uh, would uh, respond to the new cyber uh, threats outside the self-defense force. Uh, so I think this is the issue for us all, uh, not only uh, the government, but also the all uh, institutions, companies in Japan. And the two, two things is very important. One is the uh, cyber or space, uh, Expertise is very uh, important, and uh, we need such an uh, expertise very much. And I think it is very competitive to get such an uh, uh, expertise outside. And the legal basis also should be strong. I can just follow up on a couple of those points. Uh, Japan's cyber capabilities are very small at this point. So I think the new unit uh, right now is something on the order of 150 personnel, and they're upping that to something on the order of 180. It's a very small capability. Uh, as, as far as the offensive capability, it'll be much smaller. Obviously, U.S. Cyber Command sits on top of the NSA, which is vast and has all kinds of capabilities, and those two work very closely on the on the U.S. side. And I can't tell you off the top of my head, well, I don't know what the budget is, it's a black budget, but it's an enormous budget with, uh, you know, and an enormous organization. So Japan's starting from a very small base. It's offensive capability, again, I think we ought to ask questions and we ought to think about uh, escalatory implications, but, uh, but it's also important, if you're talking about cyber defense, you have to know what the offense is capable of 
So this, this is a means of improving Japan's cyber defense as well to understand what kind of offensive uh, tools are out there. On the space side, I'll just say a couple of things. On, in both areas, there, there's more emphasis on the capability itself than on necessarily offensive capability. So there's more emphasis on cyber defense and space support to other forces, to terrestrial forces, than there is on, say, offensive space. That's just the offensive part is just mentioned in the documents. Space is very, very expensive. I mean, even in the U.S. military system, it's often criticized as you know, an endless money sink uh, for the United States. Uh, Japan wants to develop a fairly broad array of capabilities to make those survivable against countermeasures, against counter space capabilities. Uh, that's going to cost a, a huge amount of money. We're talking about global positioning, communications, um, some kind of early warning system for launch. Anyways, there's a wide range of capabilities, and to make those survivable systems, it's unclear how much money that's going to be, but it's a the space situational awareness alone is something like 1.9 or $2 billion. Of money we're talking about. Very quickly, two points on space. Um, one of the one of the main challenges that Japan is going to face is um, a lot of the uh, space assets that Japan currently has is outside of the MOD, uh, Ministry of Defense. Um, but that's that's why it's so important that this NDPG was created as a um, created um, with a lead on National Security Secretariat, not MOD, and this whole uh, emphasis on the whole of government approaches. Um, repeatedly comes up in the document because some of these assets or ca uh, potential capacity does sit outside Ministry of Defense and Defense Forces. And uh, and when it comes to cyber, I think I would watch what kind of uh, debate, internal debate within Japanese government will evolve as Tokyo needs to really prepare for Tokyo Olympics. They are trying to make sure that all these critical in infrastructure can be secure or how to track those cyberspace against those uh, against the threat against those critical systems to make sure that Olympic can be successfully com conducted and completed. So in that realm, in, within that effort, um, this issue ought to come up. Like how to detect, when to detect, what's the, what's the line of communication or chain of command it's going to be, who authorizes what action to whom. Um, some of that probably will be start being debated as uh, Japan prepares for Olymp Olympics, or at least I would hope so. Thank you, Yuki. Um, okay, sorry, I haven't left a whole lot of time for questions, but we do have some time, and I'd like to do like a lightning round. Uh, we'll take a couple of questions um, and then let our panel address uh, what they like. Uh, when you raise your hand, I call on you. Please um, uh, let us know who you are, wait for a microphone, and, uh, and ask your question. Uh, I have a gentleman here. And then I'll go to Adam and then to uh, so, um, Steve Winters, uh, independent consultant. Uh, I direct this to uh, General Isobe. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, uh, Professor Nye was also down here from Harvard not so long ago with, and with Rich Armitage uh, rolling out the latest edition of their report. Um, and uh, during the, the, their discussion, uh, they, uh, it was suggested by some of the other authors there that uh, the, the, the formation of certain joint uh, operational commands between the U.S. forces and the Japanese defense forces would lead to an increase uh, awareness or increase jointness among the Japanese forces because, of course, they will be uh, coordinating with uh, the U.S. doctrine, which is very strongly towards joint force operations. So uh, are you, uh, do, you, do you go along with that idea that that, that, that uh, might be a productive effect of uh, that? Uh, Adam? Microphone coming. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you much, very much for a wonderful panel. My name is Adam Liff. I teach at Indiana University. I also have an affiliation at the Brookings Institution. I know time's short, so I'll keep this extremely concise. Um, in your estimation, what are the prospects for greater cooperation between MSDF and JCG going forward, especially given the uh, deepening gray zone challenge in the East China Sea? That was something that was not mentioned very much. And also, what are the prospects for US F-35Bs operating from Japanese DDHs? That was something that was teased in the media in the run-up to the actual release of the NDPG. So I'd just like to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. Sorry, the last piece? US F-35Bs in interest oh, of interoperability. US possibly operating off okay. of Japanese okay. DDHs. Thank and you. And the question earlier was uh, MSDF, Maritime Self-Defense Force, and Japan Coast Guard uh, cooperation. So that's our second question. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you all for a wonderful discussion. My name is Ben Rimland. I'm a research associate at CSIS. Um, my question is about a very niche capability, uh, the new uh, cooperative engagement capability um, that has been introduced on the Maya class series of destroyers and is being discussed as included as a feature on the E2Ds that the Air Self-Defense Force is set to purchase. Um, what's your view of this capability? Do you think that it's a major step up in information sharing between the US and Japan? And going forward, do you see the potential for other relatively cheap technologies like CEC to facilitate greater information sharing and allow Japan um, a more ready strike targeting capability in the future? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so generally, Sobe, I'll let you start and then I'll let anybody else in the panel uh, take up whatever sure. question they want to take Thank up or much. address whatever you like. Corporations and the Japan Coast Guard and the JMS Death Corporation. Um, so this is my uh, experience uh, during the Operation Tomodachi, and uh, I definitely uh, standing joint uh, headquarters in the self-defense force. But also, uh, we witnessed that the difficulties that the US forces Japan headquarters uh, difficulties to lead the all three four services uh, combatant command uh, because of the no authority there. So I think uh, Indo-PECOM has such authority. So how to integrate uh, these two forces so I think uh, we need to start with the Indo-PACOM uh, with, in, with this issue. How about uh, having the capability of a joint operation capability in uh, the quota areas? This is my And about the Coast Guard and the JMSDF, uh, I think uh, we need to add a police force here. And uh, the guideline says that uh, Interagency coordination is very important. So I just advocated that the overall security uh, strategy of Southwestern Islands is very important. Question and uh, US F 35Ds on. First of all, since generally Sobe won't plug his own book, uh, and I hope I'm not revealing anything he doesn't want revealed, but he has a he has a terrific manuscript uh, that hopefully will be forthcoming soon as a book on the on the disaster at 311, and he makes a very very eloquent case for for jointness. So I think he's he's been a true leader on this front. Um, uh, all right, to address some of these questions, uh, as far as uh, U.S. and and uh, and Japan combined command, I think that's. As far as an actual combined command, I think that's still prohibited under the Japanese Constitution. Um, but if the U.S. had a joint sub-unified command of its own in in Japan, if it if it actually were planning on operating a conflict in a crisis from from Japan itself, uh, that would allow it to pl plug in with the Japanese self-defense forces much more effectively, and I think it would encourage jointness on the Japanese side as well. Um, there are many reasons to do this, not just the coordination issue, but I think now uh, with the prospect of the degradation in, in, a, in any conflict of our bandwidth and our ability to communicate between PACOM and Hawaii and, and, and our forward deployed forces, there are operational reasons as well. Some of the other questions, do you think we'll see F US F-35s on the Iz Izumo class? I think the answer is probably yes. Um, it's interesting, I believe we've seen U.S. V-22s on not the Izumo class, but on the Hugo class, which is kind of intriguing. So both these aircraft generate a lot of heat. The decks have to be, um, you know, you have to make the deck capable of, of handling uh, those two aircraft. And I think they still need to do some of that work to make sure that the Izumo can take the F-35B. With the Hugo, I think they put some additional decking down. So this is possible to handle in a variety of ways. The Izumo really, I think, was designed with the F-35B in mind, honestly. Um, so the elevators can take the F-35B. Um, uh, th this shouldn't be a problem. But I think in the meantime, we, we will certainly see tests using the US F-35B. Uh, on the cooperative engagement capability question, yes, absolutely, v very important. 
for the, for this integrated uh, air and missile defense uh, for any air integrated air missile defense um, campaign. Um, you know, relatively inexpensive. I think it's a way to to network some of the legacy systems and get the most out of them, I, while obviously in, in, you know making the most of the the new capabilities like the F-35 and some of these new uh, missile systems that are being introduced. Very quickly on the F-35B um, Izumo situation, um, I would not be surprised if they start testing that out in some of those uh, joint training that they do. Um, that's how um, Osprey landed on a Huga. So I would, kind of, I can definitely see that happening. Not maybe not next year, but then maybe a couple of years down the road um, as Japan gets more serious about. Actually, this current NDPG says about 40 of the 105 that they're going to buy, maybe may, may become B. But then, depending on the situation, they there could be a decision to ink up that number in a zero sum way. So less A and then more B, but then they can't make those decisions without testing those out. And it will be it will make more sense to test it with the one that's currently flying, which is. Great, thank you. Time for one more question. Like, but if not, we can wrap things up. And uh, we also have a great panel uh, coming up. Our second panel. Um, Sure. Sure. I have a microphone here. Oh, sure. I'm Andre Sobazon. I'm a, a partner and director for Vietnam, Southeast Asia, and Washington for the Interstate Traveler Company. Uh, we're focused on a hydrogen superhighway. Now, my question is this. It's a great panel, but I just wondered, is I, I read sometimes, I'm see, getting some kinds of um, inputs from various people about Okinawa. and and so my question is, and, 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 and these inputs are sometimes not benign. I mean, they're, they're saying, join a demonstration at the Japanese embassy or something to take the part of Okinawa or something. My question is simply, is this a complication in, in our, uh, our Japanese-American cooperation going forward on all the issues you've been talking about? Is it a co complicating or just a minor irritant? Well, we could do an entire program on that that issue, uh, um, and uh, but it's a I mean it's a very relevant question in a couple of ways. Um, I'll just say, you know, first of all, you have this whole idea of increasing jointness and interoperability, uh, and the idea of more integrated basing and and uh, 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 where in Okinawa is the one place where we have less integrated basing than we do in almost all the rest of Japan, the United States and the Japanese Self-Defense Forces share and have rights to, to share facilities uh, quite liberally. Um, there's some consideration of maybe there's ways to do that in Okinawa. Would that help with some of the uh, issues related to uh, tension with the, the, the concentration of US bases there? So there's a whole area of, of, of discussion there. Um, then, of course, you have, if there is some kind of accident or incident related to U.S. bases in Okinawa that has a major impact uh, on um, uh, the, the stability and the sustainability of U.S.-Japan security cooperation and, and the future. So there are a lot of relevant uh, issues on that front. Um, for the sake of time, I might not be able to get into to do it justice, but uh, I don't know if anybody else wants to add. Uh, <laughs> Uh, let's let's hold that thought. Actually, and, and then the second um, panel may uh, want to take up some of these things. So we're gonna we have a, a great panel, including uh, former Vice Minister uh, Nishi uh, Masanori Nishi from uh, Japan Ministry of, uh, of Defense, with us Caleb Redden uh, from the U.S. Department of Defense, and Kathleen Hicks uh, from CSIS and former uh, uh, high-level official at the U.S. Department of Defense to talk about kind of policy implications on the U.S.-Japan alliance dynamics uh, related to the new NDPG. So we're going to take a short break and resume at uh, 1045 uh, sharp. Uh, but in the meantime, um, and I will turn it over to Sayuri uh, Rome, uh, who will lead the next panel. Uh, but I, I really want to thank my, my panelists uh, for wonderful discussion, great preparation, and uh, I've really learned a lot today. So thank you very much.
Please join me in thanking you.